the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The beginning was the word, and the word was with God. He had the mind, the precious mind of Christ. We can be sure. my guitar can you shut that off for me like a roadie good roadie please no really serious it saves me from getting over there bending over there I'm, fi I'm almost 52 so I might hurt myself if I lean over and you know pull my I might pull a muscle in my back thank you very much for that hey don't laugh I pulled a muscle the other day making my bed I can pull a muscle just because I'm such, a, I'm such a finely tuned machine, my muscles are so ripped that I could pull a muscle just smiling. Oh, geez, in fact, I might have just did it right there. So anyways, I'm kidding. It's my way of being funny. So, uh, of course, nobody likes my humor. All right. Cheyenne, you did that. Oh, very good. Thank you. When did you do that? I didn't see you do that. You didn't do it? He did it? You, really? So you would, she wouldn't be able to do it, right? Good. Very good. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, could you turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9, verse 1? We're going to finish off Daniel's intercessory prayer here this evening by noting verse 19, uh, where we have Daniel presenting five requests of God which demonstrate his concern for God's reputation among the nations. And this is going to be a good lesson for us to learn that when we enter into prayer, we should be looking to, for, uh, to enhance God's reputation, to glorify God uh, through our prayers so what we, and what we ask for. So uh, we take a moment of silent prayer now to examine ourselves, to determine if we need to confess any sins to the Father. Uh, failure to confess your sins as a believer will result in discipline. Uh, this is one of the things that Paul talked about with the Corinthians. So if you decide you don't, have to, you don't want to confess your sins, you're out of fellowship with God, and if you stay out of fellowship with God because of refusing to confess your sins, then you will be disciplined by God from His attribute of love, 
because he loves you, so he will discipline you, so you will go and confess your sins. And uh, so uh, that uh, confession of sin, it not only restores the fe- fill- uh, the fellowship, our fellowship with God, but also the filling of the Spirit. Uh, of course, you can't divorce the filling of the Spirit and fellowship from God. Uh, the fellowship, uh, filling of Spirit is the means by which we have fellowship with God. And the filling of the Spirit is synonymous to letting the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls, which is uh, commanded of us in Colossians 3.16. The filling of the Spirit is commanded of us in Ephesians 5.18. Why do I say they're synonymous? Because they bear the same results if you look at both passages. And also, of course, that makes sense because 2 Peter 1.20 20 and 21 says the Holy Spirit inspired the Bible. So uh, this is a very uh, important time. We want to be worshiping God in, by means of the Spirit and truth, and we do that. The first step in doing that is the confession of sin. And we've been studying Daniel's intercessory prayer on behalf of Israel, and we'll see tomorrow evening in verse 20 that Daniel actually points out that he confessed his sin before he started confessing the sin of Israel, uh, which is a good thing because otherwise God wouldn't accept Daniel's intercessory prayer if he wasn't in fellowship with him. So uh, we're going to learn, continue to learn some lessons from Daniel uh, here in Daniel chapter 9 before we get to the great 70 uh, weeks prophecy. And so uh, with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we just thank you again that we've come before you and uh, we can enter into prayer with you, seated at your right hand, based upon the merits of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his death on the cross and our union and identification with him in his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection and session at your right hand. So Father, we're aware of the fact that when we offer up this prayer as a corporate unit that we're... Uh, we're aware of the fact that we're in your presence and we thank you for being so gracious that you would allow uh, such sinners as ourselves into your holy presence. So uh, help us to be appreciative of that, that we can do that and that we can go to you 24-7 and now that you have uh, crucified us with your son at the cross and dealt with our problem of the sin nature and sin at the cross and also through our union and identification with your son. Now we're dead to the sin nature and alive to you so help us to appropriate our position in Christ so that we can present the members of our body as instruments of righteousness rather than unrighteousness and bring glory to you as a result. We thank you, Father, for Titus and Jody opening up their home to us and we thank you, Father, for the people not only in the Thompson household that are serious students of the Word of God but those, our brothers and sisters in Christ are part of our extended congregation both on PalTalk, the internet radio, and on and, and the, uh, and, uh, the website. So we just thank you for each and every one of them. We pray that they would receive their necessary spiritual nourishment. We pray that you would help them uh, to understand what's being taught through the power of the Spirit, to follow, uh, to get the, uh, follow the uh, guidance and direction of the Holy Spirit so that they might uh, be transformed by the message. We pray also that you would help the communicator to be sensitive as well to the Spirit's guidance and direction. We pray that the Spirit would use him as your instrument here this evening. And uh, we just pray that you would uh, give uh, Titus uh, wisdom with the sound and the recordings. We thank you for the technology that you've given to us, and we thank you for uh, Titus' service uh, with the recordings and the website and all that he does. So, Father, we just pray for this class that it would bring glory to you and, again, minister to your people. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. As I noted a few moments ago, we're going to finish off Daniel's intercessory prayer uh, for uh, the nation of Israel, in particular the Jewish exiles in Babylon. And this, uh, of course, was uh, uh, a great intercessory prayer, one of the greatest prayers in all the Bible. It's right up there with the prayers of Moses for the Exodus generation. And uh, it says in Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, during Darius' first year, and again, I'm reading from my translation at this point, I'll read... Uh, from my translation through the verses we've already covered, which would be up to verse 18. So it says in verse 1, During Darius' first year, Ahasuerus' son, who was from Median descent, who was made king over the Chaldeans' kingdom, during the first year of his reign, 
I myself, Daniel, understood by means of the scrolls the specific number of years which the word of the Lord communicated to Jeremiah the prophet for completing devastating Jerusalem 70 years. Therefore, I devoted my full attention to my Lord, the one and only God, by repeatedly presenting prayer requests in the form of pleas for mercy while fasting with sackcloth as well as ashes. Indeed, I caused myself to enter into, the, into prayer to the Lord my God. Specifically, I caused myself to enter into confession and said, O oh my Lord, the one and only God, the great one, yes, the awesome one who is faithful to his covenant because of his unconditional love on behalf of those who love him, namely on behalf of those who conscientiously observe his commands, we have sinned, thus we have done wrong, so that we've been condemned as guilty because we've rebelled. Specifically, we have deviated from your commands, that is, from your laws. Furthermore, to our own detriment, we never paid attention to your servants, the prophets who spoke by your authority, to and for the benefit of our kings, as well as our leaders, in addition our ancestors, yes, to and for the benefit of all the people belonging to the land. You are righteous, my Lord, but we are publicly disgraced, as is the case this very day to the detriment of the Judean people, as well as to the detriment of Jerusalem's inhabitants, likewise to the detriment of all Israel, those nearby as well as those far away in all the countries where you have driven them because of their unfaithfulness which they perpetrated against you. We are publicly disgraced, Lord, to the detriment of our kings, to the detriment of our leaders, as well as to the detriment of our ancestors because we have sinned against you. My Lord, our God, is merciful as well as forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. Specifically, to our own detriment, we never paid attention to the Lord our God's voice by living by means of his laws, which he gave in our presence through his servants, the prophets. Indeed, all Israel has transgressed your law. In other words, they deviated to their own detriment by never paying attention to your voice. Consequently, the sworn judgment was poured out against us, which was written in the law given to Moses, the servant of the one and only God, because we have sinned against him. Specifically, he carried out his words which he spoke against us, as well as against our rulers who ruled us, by causing a great disaster to take place against us, which has never taken place under all heaven, like what has taken place against Jerusalem. As what is written in the law given to Moses, all this disaster has taken place against us. However, we never sought the Lord's favor, our God, by turning from our iniquity, followed by giving heed to his truth. Therefore, the Lord was vigilant concerning this promised disaster in order to cause it to take place against us because the Lord our God is righteous with regards to all his actions which he has performed. However, to our own detriment, we never paid attention to his voice. Indeed, now, my Lord, our God, who caused your people to be brought out from Egypt by means of great power so that you made a name for yourself as to this day, we have sinned, we have acted wickedly. O Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, please, I beg of you, turn away your anger, yes, your righteous indignation from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For by means of our sins, as well as by means of our ancestors' iniquities, Jerusalem, as well as your people, are a disgrace among all those around us. Therefore, at this moment, our God, please respond favorably to your servant's prayer request, yes, favorably to his pleas for mercy. Indeed, please cause your face to shine upon your sanctuary for the sake of my Lord. Please incline your ear, O my God. Indeed, please respond. Please open your eyes. Yes, please see our desolate ruins, namely the city, which bears your name, because we are by no means repeatedly presenting our pleas for mercy in your pr presence on behalf of it on the basis of our righteous acts, but rather on the basis of of your great merciful acts. So we have here, Daniel's prompted to pray, as we've been pointing out by Jeremiah's prophecy, which is recorded in Jeremiah 25, 11, and 12, and Jeremiah 10 through 14. The prophecy says that Israel will be in Babylon, deported there, exiled there for 70 years. After the 70 years, they'll be brought back into the land. The Holy Spirit inspired this, of course, like the rest of Scripture. Now, why were they in there? Because they didn't obey the Sabbath rest for the lands. There were 70 that they failed to observe. There were other reasons why God sent them over there. In fact, Daniel mentions these reasons. And number one, primarily, you could sum it up with this. They refused, and they were, I should say this, they stubbornly were unrepentant in their disobedience to God's word, which is identified here with the, the phrases commands and uh, law. 
So this is, this is the predicament they got themselves into. They were severely disciplined by God, and God carried out his threat to discipline them and deport them, just as he said he would do in De- De- Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26. The sworn judgment was carried out by God because Israel was unrepentantly disobedient to God. Remember when I say unrepentant in relation to believers. It means you will not confess your sins and obey God. And that constitutes repentance for a believer. For an unbeliever, it's simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you should be saved. Repentance simply means you're doing a 180 spiritually. Instead of being out of fellowship with God, you're in fellowship with God. Instead of rejecting Jesus Christ, you're believing in Jesus Christ if you're the unbeliever. So Israel was stubbornly unrepentant. All they had to do was keep short accounts with God like Daniel was, and it never would have happened. But they didn't do that. And why would Israel do that? Because as, as it's, it's no different, the distractions from, for keeping God's word, for learning God's word, to obey God's word, the great distraction is the same thing as it was back in Israel's day, is true today in the, in the, in the, in the, in the church age in the 21st century. Namely, that Satan's cosmic system tries to seduce uh, people away from obedience to God. And he does that through all types of, it's more intense now, I believe, because of, of media is so pronounced uh, and, so, uh, and so powerful. It wasn't like that in, in the first century AD. Uh, but they did have pressure, and, and, and Satan uses this world system he has to seduce people away from fo- uh, obeying God. And Satan can use human relationships. That's what happened to Solomon. Solomon got into trouble because he valued his human relationships with his wives uh, more than he valued his relationship with God. How do we know that? Because God disciplined him because he, he started getting involved in idolatry, worshiping at the altars of the pagan gods of his wives. So uh, Israel was disciplined severely by God because they were unrepentantly disobedient to God's word. That is still t- happening today where the church, members of the church, are being disciplined because of their unrepentant disobedience to God's word. Uh, the, the, God loves his people, and like a good parent, he disciplines. Uh, he disciplines us if we stubbornly say, no, I won't obey you, God. And God cares too much about us to let us continue uh, to uh, go in the wrong direction. So uh, we have here... Uh, this, uh, this great prayer of Daniel, which expresses the love of God. If you notice, he appeals to the attributes of God. Uh, he talks about God's righteous acts in relation to disciplining Israel and also disciplining uh, the, uh, the Pharaoh's Egypt. He mentions the great power of God in delivering the Exodus generation from Egypt, and he appeals to that same power that delivered uh, Israel, uh, the Exodus generation from Egypt, he wants God to, he's appealing to God, Daniel is, to, for God to exercise that same omnipotence by bringing the, the, the Israelites back into the land of Canaan, back into the land of promise. So he's also appealing, as we say, to God's merciful acts, which we noted in Ephesians 2, stem from his attribute of love. God is merciful to us because of his great love. And so grace and mercy and compassion flow flow from God's attribute of love. So God is showing grace to the nation by saying, I'm going to bring you back. Did they earn it or deserve it? No. Now, here's another thing that's a key thing in this prayer, is that Daniel wants God's reputation to be enhanced. Uh, At this time, with Israel deported to Babylon, the Gentile nations were ridiculing the God of Israel because in that day and age, if you were def- your nation was defeated by another nation, they attributed it to the fact that their gods were more powerful than our gods. That's why we were beat. So the nations of the earth, the heathen, pagan, Gentile nations of the earth, ridiculed and blasphemed the name of God, the God of Israel, because of that. So Daniel's saying, I'm concerned about your reputation. Your people, Israel, and Jerusalem represent you. Jerusalem was the center of of worship of Yahweh. You selected it, God. And your people were selected by you personally to be a, a kingdom of priests, to represent you throughout the world, to lead people to a saving knowledge of the Lord, Yahweh. And who we know is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're the, old, the God of the Old Testament. So what we have here is that Daniel is appealing to, is, is concerned about the reputation of God, which will continue to develop here again this evening. Now look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 19. And I'm reading from the New American Standard at this point. O Lord, he says, hear. O Lord, forgive. 
O Lord, listen and take action. For your own sake, O my God, do not delay, because your city and your people are called by your name. Now, when he, excuse me, when he says, O Lord, here, that denotes that Daniel's requesting that God respond to his prayer request on behalf of Jerusalem and the Jewish exiles. And, and by the way, before I say anything further, in the language in the original in the Hebrew, the five, the five imperatives here, O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O Lord, listen, O Lord, take action, and do not delay. Each one, four of those are what we call imperative of requests, meaning Daniel's not ordering God here, so therefore you should put the word please before each one of these. The last one is a, uh, the last uh, uh, request is what we call a, uh, a, um, a, ju- a, just, a, a just of, uh, of prohibition here. It's, he's, it's a request for, it's a, pro- a prohibition and it's a request at the same time. So we could put please in there, being please do not delay God. So the, I, I want you to understand that. I'll reflect it in my translation. So he's request, making requests from God. So there's a good example to follow. And, and uh, you know what? I, I've learned from studying the Hebrew and the Greek that, you know what? Put pleas in when you talk to God. Sometimes, you know, I've, I've, in the past, hey, God, you know, God, please, that, you know, and I don't put pleas in there. I mean, think about that uh, for a second. We're not ordering God around to do anything. Please. I mean, how do you say, you say please and thank you to your mother and father? Uh, well, you, well, you should. Uh, you say please and thank you to people in general, right? How much you should if you uh, have a, any kind of uh, manners. I know I was taught that, please and thank you. And the thing is, how much more should we be polite with our God, our Heavenly Father? So, uh, O Lord, he says, here, again, that tells us that Daniel's requesting that God respond to his prayer request on behalf of Jerusalem and the Jewish exiles. And when he says, O Lord, forgive, that's a request that God offer a pardon and forgiveness to the Jewish exiles in Babylon who had sinned against him. And then he says, the third request, O Lord, listen, that indicates that Daniel is requesting that the Lord exhibit the state of paying attention to his intercessory prayer on behalf of the Jewish exiles in Babylon. So the word listen there, it means pay attention. Please pay attention. I Meaning take notice of my prayer, God. And when he says take action, that's a request that God act upon Daniel's intercessory prayer request for the Jewish exiles in Babylon. How so? By forgiving them and restoring them to Jerusalem and the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All these requests here are related to each other. They're interrelated. And we know that because take action means basically uh, fulfilling the previous three. To hear, forgive, listen. If God took action, those previous three requests would be fulfilled. And then when he says, for your own sake, oh my God, and this is what I was telling, about you, telling to you earlier, Daniel's expressing the fact that he's concerned about God's reputation here. Because he says, for your own sake, oh Lord, not mine, not Israel, your sake, God. So he says, for your own sake, oh my God, do not delay. When he says, oh my God, he said, he's saying, I, I get a covenant relationship with God. I have a relationship with God. And your, Daniel's God is your God, Christian. You can call God my God, and you should, because that's the fact. That's the reality. So that phrase, for your own sake, oh my God, do not delay, that indicates that Daniel's requesting that God not delay in acting upon his intercessory prayer requests for the Jewish exiles in Babylon for his own benefit, for God's own benefit. And then we have the reason for that previous request. Because your city, Jerusalem, and your people, the Jews, are called by your name. What does that mean? It talks about possession. It's saying Jerusalem and God, and the Jewish people are God's own possession. They're called by his name, and so is the church. In fact, we're indwelt by the Trinity. We're God's, and we're, he's ours, and I am yours, and you could say to God, I am yours, and you are mine. That's exactly the relationship we have. Just like Daniel had. We're, we, we belong to God. We own God. Uh, God owns us. And yet he belongs to us too. So because your city and your people are called by your name, that's presenting the reason why Daniel is requesting that God not delay in acting upon his intercessory prayer request for the Jewish exiles in Babylon and throughout the world. Daniel is therefore saying that Jerusalem and the Jewish people are called by the Lord's name, or in other words, they bear his name in the sense that they were designated by God to represent him. 
This is mentioned in Exodus. I think it's in Exodus 19. I made you a kingdom of priests. I want you to be, I want you to represent me. He said, God said to the, don't go there yet. Let me just check and see, and see if it's there. I'm pretty sure it is. But uh, when God selected Israel, uh, he, wanted, he, wanted to, he wanted them to represent him. He wanted them to make, uh, to be, uh, 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 he wanted him, uh, Israel to represent him before the heathen nations. Uh, and they were in a perfect spot in the world. As I pointed out, they had the land bridge uh, for, for three continents. So people would come by through this area. They're in the center of the earth. So Israel would be a great uh, place uh, for, the, for the Jews to represent God. So people would visit. They, God's design for Israel was, you know, worship me. Conduct yourself according to my word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love me with your entire being and your strength. And the world would see this. And they would come to me and, and believe in me because of your actions. But what's happened in history and what happened in Daniel's day, the exact opposite happened. Because they were called by God's name, the Jews and their bad character conduct caused people to blaspheme the name of God. Slander him. Paul mentions that of the Jews in his day. In Romans chapter 2, and he quotes, in Romans 2.24, and he quotes Isaiah 52.5 uh, and, and to, uh, to uh, support his point there about Israel and his day when they, who, re- who rejected Jesus of Nazareth as his as Messiah. Uh, you can hold your place. Look at Exodus 19, please. Exodus 19, we, got, uh, uh, we have... Uh, we did, uh, I don't know how many hours in Exodus. We did the whole book. And uh, we've done Genesis and Exodus in this ministry. And so uh, Exodus, uh, we, uh, we study this chapter. Great book. It's funny, I, I, was looking at, I look at the hits on our website, like the written library and even the audio and the, and the, and the video. Exodus is one of our biggest series. I mean, it, it's like unbelievable how, much, how many people, like in the, the triple digits now, for hits on like the written, all the written documents on Exodus and also uh, the audio and the video. We got double digits on, on all that and, and uh, it's quite, actually I think it's, yeah, and it, it's quite high that the number of hits on Exodus. So it's a very popular study for some reason, um, but um, I'm glad people are enjoying it. Now look at Exodus 19.1. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai when they set out from Rephidim, Rephidim, excuse me, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have, been what, have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice, note the condition, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, in other words, keep my word, Then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine. And look what he says. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. A nation set apart for his worship exclusively. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So notice by they would be representing God as a kingdom of priests. But they failed in that. And they were disciplined by God severely. So instead of the pur- fulfilling the purpose for which God gave them, which was to bring glory to him and lead people to a saving knowledge of him, he, Israel's bad conduct drove the nations away. And listen to me. It's no different today with the church. I've been bringing this out. The church is, has a terrible wit and majority in Christianity today are giving a terrible witness to the unsaved and driving people away from Christianity. Why is that? Because the Christians are either not learning their Bible and applying it, or they learn it and they don't apply it. And what happens is, by rejecting God's word, through either not listening to it or listening to it and not obeying it, what happens is, you're, you have bad conduct. And bad, con- bad do- false doctrine or not listening to the, not obeying God's word results in bad conduct. And the res- ultimate re- result is you drive people away from Jesus Christ. See, you can't just, we can't just talk about that we believe in Jesus. We can't just talk about that we're Christians. It, it, it takes more than that. It take because your words are empty and hollow if you don't back up what you talk. So the, therefore, you know, when you, 
are dedicated and devoted to God, you're, 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 dedicated, get it, you're obeying God's word, your priorities, you want your Bible classes, learning the word of God is a, a priority, fellowshipping other believers is a priority, that people see. Don't, I, I wish I could get the church to understand this. You, you look at a- Acts. Early on in the, fir- in the book of Acts, you see the church every day into the apostles' teaching. Look at Acts chapter 2. I want to show you something here. Look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Look at verse 42. Acts chapter 2, look at verse 42. They, the church, now this is right after Pentecost. 3,000 Jews have been added from all around the globe, have been added to the fellowship of the church, which was a tiny band of disciples. Now they exploded in one day, the number. Now look what was going on. They, the disciples of Jesus, following the apostles' lead, leadership, they were continually, not once a month, continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Notice what's first, teaching. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. They liked to be around each other, unlike many in the church today, especially in America, where they don't even like to hang out with each other. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. This wasn't communism, it was the love of God. When somebody had a need, they sold property, whatever, got the money and helped people out who were poor. And they needed it because a lot of people were persecuted for believing in Jesus and thrown out of their, had no businesses, they lost everything. Look at verse 46, day by day. Not, not once a month, day by day, they were continuing with one mind in the temple. I love that. And some people can't do four days a week. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, the early church met in homes. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. You notice their godly conduct, which was the result of sound doctrine, and their godly conduct caused people to take note of them. In America, no, that's not happening. The church today in America is really got a bad reputation among the unsaved. Why? Look at the church. They don't care about God's word. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. And look at it says, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. I remember I had a deacon who always tried to say, oh, we got to add to the church. I said, did you know how the Bible says to, to how we add to the church? And I, I, I explained to him that. But, you know, people, when you're, when you're a, a fleshly minded, that doesn't make sense what that just said. In our day and age, you got to put advertisements on, on the billboard, and get the little catchphrases. And, you know, we got, we got, we got, uh, we got a band playing here on Friday night. And we got kids' night over here. You know, we got the singles' night. And we got the, we got the, the married couples' night. And we got the kids' night. And we got the dogs and the cats' night. Everybody got a cat and everything. I mean, it's ridiculous. Paul and the apostles and Jesus would look at the church now and go, my gosh, this is disgusting. In fact, I know Jesus is looking at it as disgusting because it's all fleshly ideas of how to grow a church. You grow a church by doing what that says, by doing the word of God, living out the gospel as individuals, as a corporate unit. This is what Israel didn't do. The church hasn't learned their lesson. We do the same thing Israel did. We drive away the unbelievers from Christ because of our bad conduct. And that's what happened in Daniel's day. Only a small remnant, and Daniel was a part of it, was, was, was uh, faithful to God. And that meant he was one of the few in Israel who was obeying God's word. So, uh, and, and I, let me tell you something. Here's another one. If you think, uh, you know, I know some Christians, I don't know how they live with themselves. And they hear it, they hear it be teach, and they, you know, they, they, respo- they say they res- love my teach and everything, but, you know, I see them, and I get emails from time to time, and they show up, they show up, like, at, at Christmas, around Christmas time and Easter. I mean, are you kidding me? Are you listening to my teaching? If I'm such a great teacher, then why don't you do what I tell you to do? Really? 
Don't tell me I'm a great teacher and you don't obey me. That's condemning yourself then. If I'm such a great teacher and God's working through me, and he is speaking through me, because I'm going right from his word. You can see it in black and white. So therefore, uh, you're not obeying God. I mean, it's pretty stupid. And you're only fooling yourself. Some, you know, here's a great, don't be self Don't be, get involved in self-deception. Some people, we, look at me, always remember this. We always like to look good in our own eyes. Everybody's like that because we, we have a sin nature. You gotta measure yourself by what this book says. If you're doing what this book says, then good. And you know how you know that's good? You're doing it? Because the Holy Spirit will, can, will encourage you. And if you're not, he will convict you. You'll hear his voice and he'll convict you. Like there's some people when they hear me, this is so funny, and I remember Chuck Swindoll mentioned it in one of his books, and I, other pastors know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, people, there's, you could, I could have the same, say, have a message and have two different accounts of what I had to say. I, in fact, I've had many. There's people who are obedient, and they're encouraged by what I say. They're not, they're not offended or bothered by anything I say. But there another, there's another group of people. They're like, oh my gosh, you know, they're offended or, they, or they're just taken aback. And you know why? Because they're guilty. And they're so hard-hearted and they get such a callous heart that they can't hear the Spirit convicting them. And so therefore, they never make any changes. They attribute it to, well, you know, he's, he's you know, Bill or Pastor Jim, you know, nobody, you know, Pastor Jim or whoever the pastor is, you know, Chuck Swindoll, or, oh, you know, he's just, you know, he's, uh, he's picking on me, <laughs> picking on you. You know, they, 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 look at the Word of God, what it says. Are you doing it or not? If you're not, then make the change, be humble, and if you're doing it, you'll be encouraged by the Holy Spirit. If not, the Holy Spirit will convict you. So you got to make a choice. you got to make, a, you got to, growth means, look at, if we're going to grow, we have to make assessments of ourselves and be brutally honest with ourselves. We have to be, make the difficult changes in life. And it all starts priorities. What is a priority? Why do you think Israel got into the problem in Daniel's day that they got into? God's word was not a priority. God was not important to them. And they did the nod to God. In fact, Israel, and if you read Jeremiah, you know, who was a contemporary of Daniel, Israel was very religious. You know, they did all the sacrifices and everything, but their, their lips were, far, their, their lips were you know, talking about God, but their heart was far away from God. Just like in Jesus' day. You know what that means? They talk is cheap. Their, their, their actions, their lifestyle, their priorities uh, betrayed them that they don't love God. So we got to, if we're going to grow, if we're terrible, let's admit we're terrible and make, this, make changes. Because you can't grow spiritually if you're going to continue to deceive yourself and thinking, well, I'm such a great guy. I mean, look at, I'm in the Word all the time. I see things, I, you know, I, I am so super critical, of my, and I should be, but I can just say, oh man, I, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have said that, I could have done it this way, you know, and it drives, you know, it, it drives me crazy, but I have to be that way. If I'm ever going to get better as a, pa- uh, as a Christian, and then as a pastor, I got to be brutally honest about who I am. We all have to do that. And we have to measure ourselves in light of the word of God. Israel made up their own rules. They, everybody likes, the, one of the things the Jews used to do in Jesus' day, and they did it in Daniel's day, is make, you know, instead of going by what the word of God says, they make up their own rules. What do you think the Catholic Church does? They have all these rules that are not in the Bible. And yet, and, and, and they do that because why? Because they can't keep God's word, so what to do is we'll make up our own rules. We'll make up our own rules. Then we are always doing the right thing because we made the we made the we made the laws. We made the rules. We we're the God, we're God is what they're saying. People do that all the time. They do it all the time. I'll make up my own rules, whether they realize it or not. And then they be, thus become their own god. And now they're in, they're involved in idolatry. This is what's going. It's so funny. More I go into this this study of Daniel's prayer, I see the same things that Daniel was. Uh, confessing a, to God about Israel's behavior, I see the same thing in the church today. It's this, nothing new under the sun. We, st- we don't learn the lesson from Old Testament Israel. So, look at Daniel 9.19, and look at my translation, please. Uh, Daniel 9.19. Oh my Lord, please hear. 
Oh my Lord, please forgive. Oh my Lord, please pay attention and then act. Please do not delay, oh my God. And here's why. For your own sake. Not because I want it. Because for your own sake. Because for the benefit of your, benefit of your city, Jerusalem, as well as for the benefit of your people, the Jews, they are called by your name. Okay? So he's saying, do it for them. Or do it for yourself, God. Because Israel and, and the Jews, uh, the Jerusalem and, and the Jews, we're, we're to represent you. So you bring us back to the land, you'll be glorified. The, Jew, the Gentiles will stop blaspheming your name because it's going to take the exercise of your sovereignty and your omnipotence and wisdom to bring them all the way back to do something that's un, unknown on the earth at, the, at that time. So Daniel brings to an end his intercessory prayer. One of the greatest prayers in all the Bible. He brings to an end his intercessory... And, you know, let me say something. And th- th- very important. I mentioned this is one of the greatest prayers in the Bible. How sad that we ha- the church and pastors and uh, like myself, we haven't spent enough time on this prayer. We hop over it and go to the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel. How sad that we so- hop over it just because we want to get to the prophecy, but we don't pay attention. Listen to me. All scripture is God-breathed. It's important. This prayer is important just like the prophecy that follows it. So what I'm telling you is don't pick and choose what you like to hear. Listen to me. This ministry is designed for verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, book by book. Don't be skipping around all over the place. So if you're going to start Romans, start Romans and go right from the beginning to the end. All 500 hours of it. And if you want to do 1 Timothy, start at 1 Timothy and go right through the book. It takes discipline. And I, I see too many people in the church who are so lazy. There's no other way to call it. You're so lazy and arrogant if you're like that. Do not do that. This ministry in the Word of God, the study of the Word of God, is meant to go with God. Romans 1 all the way to Romans 16. First Timothy, Genesis, Exodus, uh, Daniel. God wants you to go through the whole thing, not skip around. This is not a TV program where you go, oh, I'm watching uh, uh, Two and a Half Men. Well, I'll skip that and I'll, I'll pick it up the next one. Oh, that's a good scene. I like that. I'll watch this. You know, or I'll watch you know, the Beverly Hillbillies or oh, uh, Andy Griffith. You know, you know. This, is not a t- this is God's word. I mean, think of what an insult is it? What an insult it is! It, imagine if you wrote. I told you, God's word is like love letters to us. Wouldn't it be sad if you write a love letter to your your, your girlfriend or your wife, and you you write a love letter to her, and it's like you know ten pages long, and she just skips over to the end, or skips to the part. Oh, oh I like this part. Your roses are red, violets are blue. Honey, I love you. And, you know, and you she likes that and. Wouldn't it be terrible? What, what about the rest of the stuff I wrote to you? I mean, wouldn't you be insulted and put off by that? If somebody, a 10-page love letter you sent them, and they just look at the last page, or they look at the seventh page, and they, they, they don't bother with the rest? Wouldn't you be a little bit put off? What do you think God the Holy Spirit feels like that? Jeez, you know, I, you know, I, used, to, I used to think that, uh, you know, I was being too tough sometimes. No, no, I, God the Holy Spirit through me gets mad. And I, get, I come out and I get, I, I get up, upset with that. It's like, go through the different books. Don't be lazy. Be disciplined. Have a little discipline and go. But don't, everybody's in a rush. We like microwave Christianity. You know, we want McDonald's. We want our food. Boom, boom, boom. We don't want to wait. We want it now. We don't, don't let me wait. Men are the worst. I know because I'm a man. We don't want to wait for anything. Boom, boom, boom. Give me do it right. The same thing with our teaching of the word of God. And people say, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll listen to your Daniel series when we get to the 70 weeks prophecy. Boy, that's really arrogant. And what an insult to me. More important, what an insult to God. Because the, listen to me, the church is speaking to the pastor. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit speaking to the church through the pastor. In Daniel 9.7 and Daniel 3.3 3, and Daniel 9.27, he's still speaking to each verse I teach on that. So don't insult God be humble. And listen to me, if you're, this, those are my internet people. They're the worst. God, the people in front of me, I know where they are. They're there verse by verse with me every night, pal talk people. The internet people are very, very dangerous. It's very, very dangerous. You don't be hopping around all over the place. Begin a study, complete it, 
move on to the next study. So if you're guilty, where's the camera? If you're guilty, whoever you may be out there in computer link, I have no idea. We have all these hits and, I, and, and hardly anybody ever contacts me. Once in a while, somebody contacts me and say, hey, it's not, not, you know, to encourage. And like, Once in a blue moon. And uh, I like to pass it on to, to Titus and give him encouragement too, and you guys. But, you know, whoever you are out there, because all these hits, I don't know who you people are, don't be skipping around. Don't be skipping around. You're not getting out. This ministry is not designed so you can hop and take the first hour of filling of the Spirit and then hop over to Romans 16 and, and then you're over there and you're over there. Start a study and finish it. My gosh. Start the study and then finish. Finish it. Have a little bit of discipline. You can't grow up if you're always hopping around and doing, you know, uh, you know the, this, the, the junk food thing, you know, where we're going to shove it into my mouth, boom, boom, boom. And, you know, God's word is holy treated as such so Daniel brings is in effect right here it says in Daniel 919 Daniel is in effect requesting that God restore the Jewish exiles to the city of Jerusalem because his reputation is at stake since the Jewish people in the city of Jerusalem represent him before the Gentile nations by rebuilding Jerusalem and restoring the Jews to the promised land in the city of Jerusalem In response to Daniel's request, God would be bringing glory to himself in the sense that he would have to demonstrate his attributes of sovereignty and omnipotence. God would have to exercise these attributes in order to rebuild Jerusalem and to restore the Jewish people to the promised land and the city of Jerusalem. Daniel's concern about God's reputation among the nations of the earth and thus God wants to have Jerusalem rebuilt and the Jewish people restored to this city and the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by rebuilding Jerusalem and restoring to the, the Jews to this city and the land of promise. God would enhance his reputation among the Gentiles since nothing like this had ever, been, had ever taken place in history up to that time. God would manifest to these nations by having Jerusalem rebuilt and the Jews return to the land and this city since uh, it would, uh, he would manifest himself to these nations by having Jerusalem rebuilt and Israel restored to the land and uh, in the city Jerusalem, since it would require him to exercise his sovereignty and omnipotence for this to all take place. Daniel's statements here, therefore, in verse 19, present an excellent example for God's people from every dispensation to follow. Namely, a productive prayer, a prayer that glorifies God, requires that we ask God to glorify himself and enhance his reputation among the unsaved and his people. Remember Jesus said, Father, I uh, glorify your name. And he was, he was making a prayer. And the Father spoke out of heaven for everybody. And he said, I will glorify my name. I have glorified my name, and I will continue to glorify my name. That's what he did. So, I don't even know where, it, where, where I think it's in here. It's in uh, John's Gospel, chapter 12. So, we need to, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Jesus says, um, and John, you don't have to go there. Yeah, go there. Go to John 12, 28. Let me show you this. Look at John 12, 27. Actually, look at, uh, look at John 12, 20. John 12, 12, 12. John's Gospel, chapter 12. Look at verse 20. John's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. And these men came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip, isn't it, why do you think they went to Philip first? Anybody know? See, who, see who, uh, who's really slick. There's a reason why they went to Philip and not the other guys. Anybody got to gather and take a guess? Philip was a Greek speaking person. Philip, the name is a Greek name. So they approached him. And they came and told Andrew, uh, 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 Philip came and told Andrew, and Andrew, Philip came and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Son of Man being himself. What is he talking about being glorified? Going to the cross. And then being raised from the dead. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Meaning Jesus has to die in order to bear much fruit, meaning draw all men to himself. 
He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Now he's going to give a short prayer. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it was saying that it thundered and others were saying an angel had spoken to him. And Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. And he goes on to say some other things. But notice Jesus, the, the whole object of Jesus going to the cross saying, you know, don't keep me from the cross because I have to die so I can be raised from the dead, bring in the new creation, defeat the, destroy the works of the devil, defeat sin and Satan and this cosmic system and glorify your name. I, will glor- I have glorified, I will glorify it. That's what Daniel was thinking of. Glorify your name. Bring the Jews back for, and restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Get the people back in the land again. You are people who are supposed to represent you. Glorify your name. Daniel's concerned about God's reputation. So is Jesus, of course, who is God. So go back to John's gospel. Not John's gospel. Go back to Daniel chapter 9, verse 19. Daniel chapter 9, verse 19. So a productive prayer... And we're talking about Daniel's prayer here. His prayer was a productive prayer. A productive prayer is asking God for what he wants rather than what we want. Father, not my will be done, but yours be done. Didn't Jesus say that? Father, let this cup pass, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus is concerned about, okay, I'm doing what you want. Again, how do you know what God wants? I hear people say, and you know, it's always the same people. How do I know what God's will is? Well, how about coming to Bible class once in a while and you might know? How about picking up your Bible and shut the TV off and maybe you might know? Learn, you know. In fact, I'll tell you right now, I'm not, I, my IQ is just above room temperature, but I know I have the Holy Spirit and I know God's told me what I'm supposed to do for my life and I'm not smarter than you. So all it is is engaging yourself in the effort and try to uh, and understand what God wants from you. So it takes a little work, takes a little effort. So once you know what God's will is, then you can pray effectively. But forget about trying to pray effectively if you don't know what God's will is because you don't study his word, which reveals his will. So a productive prayer is asking God for what he wants rather than what we want. God's not Santa Claus. Cut it out. Don't give him a... Cu- I want... Uh, I want. You heard me say that. I want a blonde, a wife. I want the kids. I want the house. I want, the, I want a big raise. I want, a, a, I want my, my wife to make me breakfast in bed every day. I want this, that, and the other thing. I mean, come on. God, you know, God is not Santa Claus. Prayer, productive prayer, is asking God to bring glory to himself so that his reputation is enhanced and not our own. Let me repeat that. Productive prayer is asking God to bring glory to himself so that his reputation is enhanced rather than our own. That's a little, little rebuke to some pastors who it's all about their reputation and they're getting their names in lights and then being Mr. Popularity and, and, and glorified and everybody sings their praises and instead of saying, don't bring praise to me, bring praise to God. That's what you should be saying. The destruction of this city, Jerusalem, and the deportation of the Jews to Babylon has caused the Gentiles to blaspheme the name of God, as I pointed out. Thus, Daniel wants God to fulfill his request because he wants the Gentiles to stop blaspheming God because of the sins of the Jews. So Daniel is making this request of God because of his reputation among the Gentiles and not because of any merit on the part of the Jewish exiles. Remember, as I pointed out not too long ago in in the past, the heathen mind, the, the pagan mind, the unbeliever's mind in Daniel's day believed that the God of the Jews was not strong as the God of the Babylonians and other nations since they believed that when one nation defeated another, the God of the conquering nation was stronger than the God of the nation which was defeated in battle. Daniel wants this thought to end among the Gentiles by God rebuilding Jerusalem and restoring the Jews to their homeland which would demonstrate his great power and sovereignty. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us with what we've heard. We pray that this uh, class would have pleased you and brought glory and honor to you and your son and led your people to a more intimate fellowship with yourself. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.